So thank you, Code Blue, for having me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. So for this final session of the conference, I would like to invite you to venture away with me from the predominantly deeply technical issues that you have focused on for the past two days and venture into an area that is very different, namely into the realm of international peace and security, and in particular, the issue of the international law of cyberspace. So my talk in particular will be about a very uh, contentious issue in the international discourse concerning the international law of cyberspace. It's an issue that has been around for two decades, that continues to be unresolved, that continues to divide the international community, and it's an issue about what kind of international legal architecture is best suited to govern cyberspace. At times, this issue is more dormant. Other times, it is more pervasive, more prevalent. But what we can say with certainty is that this issue continues to underlie the policy discussions that are taking place on the international level between states. Now, you may ask, why law? Why should we turn our attention to law? Why is it important to talk about the application of law in cyberspace? Now, to answer this question, we need to understand what law means. At its very fundamental level, law is a mechanism for formalizing a social construct. In the case of international law, this social construct is one that exists between nation states. So international law consists of agreements between states that set forth certain generally accepted principles of behavior, values that the international community shares, or particular states in a region share. And furthermore, international law provides us, as the international community of states, certain rules of what kind of behavior is expected of us as states, and what kind of behavior is acceptable. So that is, at the very abstract level, the task of international law. What kind of benefits do we get from having international law that regulates interstate cyber relations? Let me mention two. The first one is predictability. If we have those shared values and principles, those rules of acceptable behavior set forth as international law, then on the interstate level, we will gain some predictability. We will have some foreseeability as to how states will act in cyberspace, what kind of cyber activities they consider to be permitted under international law, and what kind of cyber operations they consider the law to prohibit the states from engaging in. Now, with predictability comes uh, stability. Foreseeability in international relations provides stability. And stability on the international plane it's a good thing. So first, what do we get out of having international law? We get predictability, we get foreseeability. We also get a degree of enforceability. Why do I say a degree of enforceability, the possibility of enforcing those rules? I suspect that most of you are familiar with your domestic legal systems. International law is very different from the, all of the domestic systems of countries in the world. How is it different? Well, domestic systems generally reflect the separation of powers. We have the legislature that creates laws for a particular country. We have the executive branch that executes and enforces those laws. And then thirdly, we have the judiciary that applies and interprets the laws. So it's a hierarchical system where there are different degrees of authority. International law is very different. International law is horizontal. 
Who makes international law? States do. Who enforces international law? States do. Who adjudicates upon international law? States do. So all of those three powers are vested in this one authority, the state. And this, of course, means that when we're talking about contentious cyber incidents between states, international law will only be enforced if states want international law to be enforced. And, of course, the country that is being accused of having breached international law will not have much incentive in international law enforcement. Okay. Why can't we enforce international law? Like I said, this power is vested in the state. We don't have an international police force that would do so. Initially, it was supposed to be the Security Council that should have enforced law, but the Security Council is constantly stuck in a veto. It would, of course, be stuck in a veto when we're talking about cyber incidents involving any of the permanent five. However, when we think about having international law in the cyber context, if our choices are no law that governs interstate behavior in cyberspace, or having international law together with its weaknesses, some of which are significant, then obviously the better option is the latter one. So proceeding on this basis, what I will talk about first is treaties generally. Then I will talk about treaties in the cyber context. And thirdly, I will talk a little bit about what kind of role Japan could play in the international discourse concerning which law to have in cyberspace. With regard to treaties, anybody who starts doing a little bit of research into uh, treaties in the cyber context will almost instantly discover that this issue is explosive. Okay. Like I mentioned here, the international community is divided. We have countries that would like to see a treaty be adopted for cyberspace, and then we have other countries that are violently pushing back against the idea. This is somewhat odd because treaties as a general matter are a good thing. Let me give you some examples. Think about the Charter of the United Nations. When the Charter was adopted in 1945, in June, in San Francisco, a little before the Second World War ended, what was the main objective of the countries that had gathered at the International Conference to conclude the Charter? They had one main goal, and that goal was to ensure that history would not repeat itself that the international community would not be forced to witness another world war. That was the main goal of the UN Charter. Let me give you a few more examples. Think about the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement clearly did not go as far as it should have. It was labeled as a failure by many. But nevertheless, if we think about what the purpose of the Paris Agreement is, successful or unsuccessful as it may have been, it is to put a cap on global warming to prevent the devastating consequences of unreversible global warming. I have a few more examples for you. Think about the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. This is one of the main international, global human rights treaties that provide certain basic rights to individuals in almost all the countries of the world. Rights such as that to be free from torture, the right to be free from slavery or forced labor, the right to be free from discrimination, importantly in the cyber context, the rights to freedom of expression, the right to privacy. Clearly, this treaty serves a noble purpose. And then finally, a bit more of an exotic example. There is a bilateral agreement between Japan and Australia that protects migratory birds that are in danger of extinction and protects their environment. So who could argue that this treaty does not serve a noble purpose, which is to preserve biodiversity? 
So at their core, treaties generally serve a good purpose. Okay. Treaties are a mechanism for states to self-impose certain obligations that sometimes are painful, that sometimes are costly and resource-intense, that limit their authority to act, but states nevertheless decide to conclude those agreements because of either their social or their political, their economic values, or like in the case of human rights law, the human dignity, the value of ha protecting the dignity of a human being. In the case of the bilateral agreement between Japan and Australia, you could say that certainly there is an island somewhere in Japan that would be the perfect place for somebody to live, with a beautiful beach, with nice nature, and you would want to live there. But Japan has taken upon itself an international commitment to not allow individuals to habitate that island. Why? Again, in order to protect that biodiversity. It is imposing a cost on the Japanese society, but the country has nevertheless decided to do so because of the values that it believes in. So if treaties are a good thing, why do we even need to ask the question whether a treaty would be good for cyberspace? Why do we even need to doubt this proposition that a cyberspace treaty is a good idea? Let's talk about this a little bit. Some of you might not know this, but we actually have a few treaties that already exist in cyberspace. We have the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, and we also have the Shanghai Cooperation Organizations Agreement, it's known as the Yekaterinburg Agreement of 2009, that concerns cooperation in the field of international information security. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization today has got eight member states, Russia, China, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and as of 2017, India and Pakistan. So this is a regional treaty that creates certain obligations for those eight countries. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization has also been pushing for a global treaty, and it has done so since 2011. They called this the International Code of Conduct for Information Security. The member states of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization have submitted proposals under the umbrella of the United Nations in 2011 and 2015. This proposal has not gathered global acceptance. We will talk about why this is the case, but like I said, the countries in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization would ideally also like to see a global treaty governing cyberspace. And then we have lots of liberal democracies who are pushing back against the idea of having a treaty in cyberspace. Japan is one of them, but the most vocal ones have been the countries in the Euro-Atlantic space. The European Union made this crystal clear in 2013 in its cybersecurity strategy. The European Union explicitly said that it does not call for the creation of new international legal instruments for cyber issues. Now, why is that the case? We spent quite a bit of time talking about the fact that treaties are a good thing. Why doesn't the EU want to see treaties in cyberspace? Why don't other liberal democracies want to have a treaty in cyberspace? Well, today there is one very powerful reason that has got nothing to do with cyber, but rather with the current state of international affairs. We live in turbulent times. I'm sure you all agree. In interstate relations, we're witnessing a lot of contestation, a lot of confrontation. We're seeing a trend towards isolationism. We're seeing a lot of competition. And we're seeing tough guy politics rather than the pursuit of friendly relations between states. And I'm sure you would agree that this type of environment is not conducive to treaty negotiations. Think about the following example. Think about Brexit. 
and the UK efforts to leave the European Union, clearly indicating a desire against international institutionalism. Think about the United States withdrawing from pretty much every treaty imaginable, most recently threatening to pull out of the treaty establishing the International Postal Union. The United States under the Trump administration has been so active in withdrawing from treaties that it even led the former legal advisor to the State Department characterize the US actions as an assault on international law. So on this one hand, we're witnessing a desire not to be involved in international organizations, in international mechanisms. And on the other hand, we're seeing some pretty blatant violations of international law. Think about what China is doing in its Western part in relation to the Uyghur Muslim minority. There is no doubt that China is violating international law. Or think about this recent report that Russia is intentionally bombing hospitals in Syria. So 2019 is not a good year for instit international institutionalism. 2019 is not a good year for international relations generally, and it certainly is not a good time for international treaty negotiations. So this is one of the main reasons that, like I said, has got nothing to do with cyber, why negotiating a cyber treaty in this particular point in time would be a futile effort. There are, however, some problems that are unique to the idea of a global cyberspace treaty. So let me talk briefly also about those issues that have directly to do with cyber and the reasons why I say that in 2021, we definitely will not see a convention on international cybersecurity be adopted. Treaties usually begin by identifying and defining the terms with which the treaty operates. So it's usually the first or second article in the treaty that defines the key terms. Many of you will know that terms in the cyber context are also a contentious issue. We might have at the negotiating table, the Estonian diplomat put her hand up, say, let's define cybersecurity. What would happen next? The Russian diplomat would say, what are you talking about? We should be talking about information security, not cybersecurity. And this issue isn't just about linguistic preference. This issue reflects a fundamental difference in the scope of regulation that a potential cybersecurity treaty should undertake. So Western liberal democracies, when they, not in the context of a cybersecurity treaty, but in cybersecurity negotiations generally, they prefer the term cybersecurity because they're more concerned with attacks against the infrastructure. And Russia and China and other authoritarianism-leaning countries, they, yes, they're concerned with the cybersecurity aspect of the problem, but perhaps even more, they're concerned with the information aspect of the problem. In other words, they view as a threat for themselves the information that can be conveyed via this cyber medium, and if they were to engage in international treaty making, they would want to make sure that the treaty also regulates what kind of information states are allowed to communicate via cyberspace and what kind of information is off limits. So that's one problem. It has to do with definitions. For me, the bigger problem has to do with what the treaty is supposed to regulate. The infrastructure versus information issue is one, but more broadly, today we have no idea what this hypothetical cyber treaty should regulate. In other words, what should its articles 3 to 17 say? And for this reason, this whole debate about treaty or no treaty is somewhat bizarre. 
A treaty is supposed to regulate state conduct in our context in cyberspace, but states, even individually, and not, to, not the least collectively, don't have a good idea as to what kind of behavior they want to allow in cyberspace and what kind of behavior they certainly want to limit. So what is our second best option? If a treaty is off the table for now, what are we left with? What we're left with, at least for the time being, is to work with what we have. Let me come back to the UN Charter. Remember I told you that the main purpose of the Charter of the United Nations was to prevent the outbreak of war. How does the United Nations Charter achieve this purpose? Firstly, predominantly, through Article 2, subparagraph 4, that makes it illegal for states to resort to force in their interstate relations. If you want to analogize to domestic law, then this is one of the strongest constitutional norms of international law. Use of force is unlawful, except in certain limited cases. For example, when the Security Council authorizes the use of force, or when the state is acting in self-defense. So we know for sure that the use of force under existing international law is unlawful. In the, cyber, in the cyber context, the question now arises, can a cyber operation by one state ever amount to an unlawful use of force in the sense of the United Nations Charter, such that when the state engages in such a cyber operation, it has breached Article 2, subparagraph 4. Lots and lots and lots of academic literature has been written on this topic. The answer today is an unwavering yes. Yes, cyber operations sometimes will constitute a use of force, and unless an exception to the use of force exists, that use of force will be unlawful. The big question is, well, what kind of cyber operations are we talking about? When would a cyber operation reach this threshold? And like I said, a lot of scholarship exists on this very issue. And slowly we're seeing states also come out with their interpretations of this particular provision in the cyber context. In the past couple of days, I've been asked a lot of questions about the Tallinn Manual. Many of you will have heard of the Tallinn Manual, many of you will have not. Let me just briefly say that the Tallinn Manual was an academic effort hosted by the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence based in Tallinn, Estonia, to look at how existing international law, the pre-cyber international law that was adopted before cyber existed, how this body of international law applies in the cyber context and how it either limits states' behavior or what kind of rights it affords to states. It is an academic project. Uh, it's more than 500 pages in length. What can you conclude from this fact? Well, you can conclude that existing international law apparently must have quite a bit to say about what states can or cannot do in the cyber context. And the takeaway for the treaty discussion is, well, obviously a treaty, a cyber treaty, should only regulate states' activities in cyberspace to the extent they are not already governed by existing law. So this is treaties and cyber, what to think about this issue. Let me now turn to Japan. How could Japan participate in those discussions? Japan actually already does so. The United Nations Secretary General each year invites member states to report to the Secretary General on different matters concerning cyber in the context of international peace and security. And Japan has reported to the, security, to the Secretary General on a couple of occasions, most recently this year. And in its submission, Japan, among other things, upheld the notion, 
that law plays a role in cyberspace. Both domestic law and international law are important. Japan has endorsed the premise that existing international law applies, which means that it is not ultimately necessary for states to start negotiating a treaty straight away. And Japan sees the role of international law as essential for the sustainable development of cyberspace as a safe and reliable place. So that's a pretty good start. But what this statement doesn't tell us is how Japan understands the application of international law in the cyber domain. It doesn't tell us which rules Japan considers to be important, which rules limit Japan's and, of course, other states' behavior in cyberspace, and what kind of rights international law accords to Japan. But your country has an opportunity to continue conversing on this topic. There are currently two processes underway in the United Nations that deal with the normative architecture of cyberspace. One of them is the so-called United Nations Group of Governmental Experts. So it is a group of 25 different country representatives that meet between 2019 and 2021, and they're tasked to look at the three key components of the normative architecture of cyberspace. First, international law. Second, voluntary non-binding norms of responsible state behavior. That's best practice, if you will, that is not required by law, but states that act responsibly will nevertheless engage in. And third, confidence-building measures. Certain practical measures that will help to build confidence between states and that will help to prevent the accidental breaking out of a conflict in cyberspace. This is the resolution that establishes the group of governmental experts. The second process that is currently underway in the United Nations is the so-called open-ended working group. And its mandate is very similar. Why have two groups that deal with essentially the same issue? This is again a manifestation of international politics. The group of governmental experts was uh, proposed by the United States, okay. and the open-ended group, open-ended working group, was proposed by the Russian Federation. And the General Assembly adopted both resolutions, so now we have two groups with a very similar mandate. The group of governmental experts, like I said, consists of representatives of 25 countries, and Japan is one of them. I also said that the GGE will be looking at the issue of international law. This is what the mandate says. The group is expected to produce a consensus report. It might not work out, but if it does, then that consensus report should have an annex that consists of the national positions of all of the 25 countries that are members of the GGE on the issue of how those countries interpret law in the cyber context. So Japan will be expected to publish such a report that will be annexed to the GGE's report. When Japan does so, I'm sure that your country will look at what other countries have said in the past. There are a handful of countries that have come out with pretty detailed articulations of how they understand and apply international law in cyberspace. One is the United States. They have several documents. One of them is from the Department of Defense. It is their Law of War Manual. And here they have a robust chapter on how the United States would apply the law of armed conflict, the law of war, to cyber operations that occur in the context of a war. Then we have a speech by the United Kingdom, by the UK's former Attorney General from last year. In that speech, the United Kingdom set forth some principles of international law that they follow predominantly during peacetime. Okay. And then finally, just a few months ago, the Netherlands government submitted a report to the Netherlands Parliament 
a nine-page report talking about how the Netherlands applies and understands international law in cyberspace. Now, if you were to look at those documents more closely, you'll see that there's a lot of text, but none of those documents really get to the heart of the matter, which is what kind of cyber operations will be off the table, what kind of cyber operations will be permissible. In other words, where does, does the, law, uh, the line for legality, the line for lawfulness and unlawfulness lie? And states are not clearly setting out this threshold for an understandable reason. They don't want to tie their own hands. Okay? They want to leave certain options on the table, so they're just slowly chipping away at the edges, but they refrain from drawing those red lines. Does this present a strategic opportunity for Japan? Maybe. Perhaps the question that is uh, more important in this audience is, well, how can the technical community participate in those discussions? And should you even do so? My answer is that you can for sure, and you should for sure. Why do I say this? First, you can help your government answer the fundamental question that needs to be answered before developing any legal policy on the issue. And that question has to do with whether Japan sees cyberspace as a Wild West. Are you dissatisfied with what you're witnessing in cyberspace? Are you, as the technical community, upset with what you're seeing happen in this domain? Are you witnessing cyber operations by other states that you believe international law should not tolerate? So are you seeing cyberspace as a wild west? Or are you seeing cyberspace as somewhat chaotic, but nevertheless, there is order in this chaos, and international law appears to be working just fine? Of course, international law, just like domestic law, will never succeed in avoiding all violations. Just like violations of the law occur domestically, violations of the law will occur internationally. But when you look at the big picture, do you say, well, things are kind of okay, and there isn't a big problem? So this is the fundamental question that Japan and every other country will need to answer before developing legal policy, and it is a question that the technical community can weigh in on. If you see cyberspace as a Wild West, then you can use international law to uh, create rules that would help prevent this type of behavior that you, sh you believe should not exist. And if you see cyberspace, even in its chaos, as an environment where things are working pretty well, then you can use and direct international law in the direction in order to maintain the status quo. Now, you as techies, should you weigh in on those deliberations? Let me give you a word of advice. It was in the 1990s, in 1996, when John Perry Barlow, an American poet uh, and essayist, wrote the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. I'm sure many of you have read this before. And in this declaration, Tom Perry Barlow essentially said that cyberspace should be outside governmental regulation, that cyberspace should exist in a regulatory vacuum because things work well in cyberspace. So John Perry Barlow, he was a cyber libertarian, but whether you like it or not, those times are over. Cyberspace is being subjected to regulation, both domestically and internationally, and this probably is a good thing rather than a bad thing. As our societies depend more and more on cyber capabilities, the risk that comes with this dependence is by definition higher, and it is the role of the law 
to try to prevent those risks from materializing. So you as techies, even if you believe that cyberspace should not be subjected to regulation as a principal position, you should let that go. It doesn't mean that you should resist regulation, that doesn't make sense, but as a general matter, regulation is happening, it will continue to happen. What else can you do as the technical community? Well, as the technical community, you can help keep us lawyers, can help keep the diplomats, can help keep the policymakers grounded in technical realities. I may be able to open the terminal on my MacBook or iMac, and I may be able to find out what my IP address is, but that's pretty much the extent of my cyber capabilities. So I don't understand cyber very well, but if I were a policymaker, I would want to come forward with policy proposals that are sensible. And I might not always see the foolishness in some of my policy proposals. So I would want to rely upon you, the techies, in keeping me honest when it comes to the technical realities. So I would like you to tell me, what are you talking about when I come up with a proposal that doesn't make the slightest bit of sense? But I would also want you to give me a thumbs up if you believe that I've done a good job and the regulation that I've thought of would make sense, would be a good thing to have in cyberspace. And with that positive note, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>